And now, <laughs> onto today's roundtable, the ethics of writing engage your personal. Our speaker is Catherine Mack, professor of English here at UCCS. Uh, she has a PhD and MA in comparative literature from the University of California, Irvine. She is interested in how rhetorics of the self and personal experience influence how we live, feel, and relate to ourselves and others, to social, cultural, and political movements, and to institutions. Her sites of research are wide ranging, encompassing truth and reconciliation efforts in South Africa, motherhood and family in the United States, the genre and practice of life writing, and rhetorical pedagogy in the area in the era of truth decay. Across these diverse sites, she aims to illustrate how the personal and life narratives function rhetorically in ways that are both productive and problematic. Dr. Matt Mack has written two monographs, From Apartheid to Democracy, The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, published by Penn State University Publishing in 2014, and The Case for Single Motherhood, Contemporary Maternal Identities and Family Formations, which is forthcoming from the University of Alabama Press as well as articles in academic journals and essays in edited collections. Her current project is an examination of intimacy, motherhood, and family. This project has her dancing on the boundaries of various genres of creative nonfiction. Dr. Matt teaches a, teaches a range of upper division rhetoric and writing courses, including advanced rhetoric and writing, rhetorics of post-apartheid South Africa, rhetorics of family, and various iterations of rhetoric and writing some books. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melissa, for all of the back and forth, and thank you all for coming and uh, staying in the room because it would be very sparse indeed if, if anybody left. So if you have to leave early, be so quiet. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so uh, no further ado. I had my introduction. I'm not going to even read what I had prepared to say about myself, other than that the through line through the seemingly disparate projects. You might be wondering, how can this woman write a book about writers of truth and reconciliation in South Africa, and then a book about single motherhood in the United States? And the answer is that I'm a rhetorician and, and we, we move into different areas. But the better answer is that the, there's a theme that I didn't realize until I was writing my second book and, and that theme is, or that focus is, I'm interested in how we draw from the personal, how we express the personal in different genres to do different kinds of rhetorical work. And that's obviously what I'm going to be talking about today. But first, we have to cover some, some basic groundwork, starting with what is rhetoric? You might be familiar with this term. You've probably heard, oh, that's mere rhetoric or that's rhetoric critical. There are as many definitions of rhetoric as there are rhetoricians. But I often share this one from my fellow rhetorician, Krista Radcliffe. Um, I like this definition because it emphasizes the dual movement of rhetoric, what we do to it and what it does to us. So what we do to language and what language does to us. While rhetoric includes visual and material language, for example, you walk into a Starbucks, there's a certain color scheme, uh, kind of furniture, dark wood, it's meant to be cozy, make you feel like you're in a cafe. That's material rhetoric, and there are, of course, visual rhetorics. Uh, but what we're going to focus on today is uh, written language, writ written rhetorics. And by the dual language, just to emphasize that, rhetors, the person who's producing the rhetoric, does something with language to achieve certain effects. It's consequential language, but rhetoric also has an effect on us. So as a rhetorician, I study what rhetors do with and to language, and I also am interested in how that language ends up shaping us as individuals and on a societal level. I am inspired by and seek to extend John Duffy's work on ethics and writing. Here I highlight two key and interrelated points from his book, Provocations of Virtue, Rhetoric, Ethics, and the Teaching of Writing. First, in writing, we invite an exchange between ourselves and others. 
in that sense, ethics has everything to do with writing. Because anytime you enter into a relationship with another being, your ethics are, are engaged. Secondly, therefore, writing involves ethical choices. Who, who am I bringing to this exchange? Um, who are these other people to whom I'm writing? What do I owe them? Who am I? What self am I bringing to this exchange or to this scene of writing? Our focus is often on the others that we hope our rhetoric will reach an effect with writing our readers or, or our reader or our readers. So we're thinking about what, what this rhetoric that I produce, how is it going to go out into the world and affect the people out there who might read it? Uh, the other, however, also consists of the places, objects, people, and experiences about whom we write. This first image here conveys the diverse sources that we incorporate in the making of our rhetorical arrow. So think here, this is our rhetorical arrow. These are all of the sources that go into the making of it. We have a relationship and thus ethical obligations with those sources as much as, as we do with those to whom we direct our rhetoric. So if you think about, I couldn't find an image with little arrows here that represent the sources that we draw on, the big arrow of our rhetoric, the text that we create, and that text goes out into the world to lots of different readers. And, and I, my argument is that as ethical rhetors, we need to be thinking about how we engage these sources as much as we engage these sources here. And the sources can be texts, they can be people, they can even be objects. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, okay, so thinking uh, her, her cells were preserved without her knowledge, without her consent, and they continue to be used in research and written about. And that was an ethical travesty. So when we're thinking about our ethical obligations, how we use things, people, ideas, um, and then what we do with this. What's going on though with the second arrow, you might be wondering. That blue arrow lies on top of a set of lines that are running in many directions. Our exchanges with, other, with others occur in this chaotic rhetorical context, which consists not only of different intellectually responsible perspectives, but also of misinformation, disinformation, alternative facts, and fake news. These circulate and proliferate on social media, reinforcing our filter bubbles and fostering toxic and divisive discourses. In the last de decade, this discursive context, which some describe as post-true or the era of truth decay, has led to a resurgence of interest in the role of ethics and virtues, probably across many disciplines, I know within my own, um, it certainly has. The launch of generative AI, which raises novel questions about authorship and integrity, further complicates this rhetorical scene. So in short, what you see here is your rhetoric, whatever text you generate, is going out into this kind of chaotic mess. And that complicates your ethical decision making. In short, negotiating the context from which our rhetorics emerge and into which our rhetorics go entails ethical decision. This next slide is not, not, not quite necessary because you have it written up here, but if you can't see it here, um, the DNLs Fund Ethics Initiative principles offer a helpful set of, of starting points with which to negotiate these contexts, and they are even though I'm sure some of you are probably can recite them by, by memory. Um, I won't include the definitions, but integrity, trust, accountability, transparency, fairness, respect, rule of law, and viability. Again, um, they offer a helpful starting point. But we need, I argue today, um, what rhetorical scholars call virtue ethics to apply these principles to the complicated act of writing. In other words, what I'm saying is these offer a helpful starting point, 
but they only get us so far. Uh, what are these virtue ed ethics and how can they move our thinking along? Rhetoricians will often respond to questions about what a rhetoric should write with, it depends. This is eminently frustrating for students because they'll say, why, what, what, how should I handle this? Well, it depends. What are you trying to do? To whom are you writing? Uh, while people's usage differs, ethics are often associated with codes or rules and asserted as such. Do this, do that, be honest, be transparent, be accountable. In contrast, virtue ethics and the virtuous rhetoric who uses them knows which virtues to enact in which settings for which reasons, which is right here. So the virtuous speaker and writer is not guided by codes or rules, but knows which virtues to enact in which settings for which reasons. You could apply this to the principles. Here are some examples of virtue ethics that can guide us and our students through the complicated ethical context in which most writing occurs. First, phronesis, uh, which is the, uh, the translated as practical wisdom, and is considered by many in my field to be the supreme virtue that guides all others. Phronesis, in other words, can guide us toward knowing which virtues to enact, in which settings, for which reasons. Open-mindedness and intellectual humility foster a respectful stance toward others' viewpoints. Open-mindedness, I think it's uh, somewhat obvious about what it is. You're, you're open to hearing different perspectives. Intellectual humility is knowing that you have but one perspective and that there is almost always, or there are almost always other legitimate perspectives, even if ultimately not the most persuasive about whatever topic you are engaging. And then finally, nuance. Nuance allows us to think through the meaning and implications of different ethical principles. So an easy uh, example that I often use is, if you're a doctor and your patient asks you, am I going to die? And maybe you know that your patient is gonna die in the near future, but that patient has also told you that he is an optimist and a glass half full kind of guy, you could be honest and say, your prognosis is, um, you know, we're, we're looking at palliative options here, not curative options. That's honest without saying you're going to die. So that would be an example of phronesis and nuance, nuance in action. Blunt honesty is not always what's called for, even though honesty is always called for. When we return then to the principles through the lens of virtue ethics, a series of helpful questions emerge. These questions guide us toward our always contingent response to the question, how do we know which virtues to enact, in which settings, for which reasons? What I'm gonna do now is just walk us through, through respect, what are the questions that follow from these virtues when we read them through the lens of virtue ethics? Integrity. How can and to what extent should writers uphold honesty with their sources and readers about their authorial decisions, including decisions about what they have included and excluded in the text they create? For example, it's impossible to say to, or to, to cite every single idea that informed your writing of a text in most cases. If you're citing directly, yes, you include a citation paraphrasing, if you wanna to refer to a body of literature, but at a certain point, you, you can't continue, continue doing that. And if you're writing something that isn't a work of scholarship, then often the, the, the question becomes even more challenging to answer. You have to make more decisions. So to what degree uh, or what does honesty look like in a writing situation such as that one? And then what does integrity mean in the writing of creative nonfiction 
or fiction. What did, when, when we're creating artistic texts, what does integrity look like in the creation of those artistic texts? Different questions emerge. Trust. Who are the stakeholders in writing? We know build trust in all stakeholder relationships. Are our stakeholders our readers? Are our stakeholders those who are affected by a text, even if they don't read it or ever get their hands on it? How do we as writers build trust with all of the different potential stakeholders in our writing? Or thinking back on that image of the little arrows that feed the big arrow, our stakeholders are also all of the people and sources and objects that helped us to create that text. How do we build trust with these all of these different stakeholders or even begin to think about that question? First, of course, we have to pose it. Accountability, accept responsibility for all decisions. What are the different stages and ways that writers take and demonstrate responsibility for all decisions in the text? And then again, to whom are we accountable? Are we accountable to ourselves? Is that what integrity means in, in writing contexts? Are we accountable to our primary audiences and we wash our hands of what our writing does beyond our primary audience? Are we responsible or accountable to the people about whom we are writing, even if those people might not read what we've written? Um, are we responsible to the people who might get a hold of our writing, even without our intending for that to happen? Again, I have no answers to these questions. My point is that when you apply the virtue ethics to the Daniels principles, I think we get a rich set of questions that writers need to think about as we, as we write. Transparency. Maintain open and truthful communications. How can writers maintain open and truthful communications in the production of rhetorical texts? What does transparency mean in a writing situation? To, to or with whom are writers being transparent? So the same set of questions, rhetoric is so much about audience and questions of where are we directing these words? What do we want people to do with them? How do we generate them? What will they do when they get out into the world? Fairness. Engage in fair competition. That was when I, I didn't engage. It, it felt not as relevant. But this one, create equitable and just relationships. How do we do that with our sources, especially when they're deceased or when they're material or they're an object, a document somewhere in an archive? What does it mean to have an ethical relationship with sources that may have been used by other people in unethical ways or with, with which we don't have a direct relationship? Uh, what, what would an ethical, uh, fair exchange or interaction with those sources look like? Respect, the last one. Honor the rights, freedoms, views, and property of others. Again, this is complicated. How do we as writers enact and demonstrate honor for the viewpoints of others in the production of texts? When does honoring fall into both sides of them? the troubling practice of giving equal time, space, airtime, and attention to, to positions that are not intellectually or ethically legitimate. And further, what does honor mean or look like to different stakeholders? That's also a key question to ask. Virtue ethics also have pedagogical value. The virtues offer as well, should we choose to speak and write it, a language we might share with our students. My belief as a faculty member here at UCCS is that our primary goal, our primary responsibility is to instill in our students a sense of ethical and responsibility and to create virtuous rhetors, no matter their discipline, uh, because they're going to go out into the world and that's the, these are the questions, this is the framework 
that we want to send them out into the world with. I have three questions. What kinds of writing happens in your disciplinary or professional context? Two, what ethical conundrums related to writing emerge in your context, in your field, either in your own writing or what you've witnessed around you? Um, and then thirdly, what additional questions or nuancing of the DFBI principles does your context require? What you heard me just do was say, as a teacher in rhetoric and writing studies and as a scholar of rhetoric, I need to have nuance, I need to have phronesis, I need to have open-mindedness and intellectual humility. What are some virtues that your field requires that are helpful or if, when you put them into dialogue with these principles? So we're moving on to the controversial part of my presentation and I love that we're doing that in the last few minutes. It's like a good therapy session, the good stuff comes out at the end. Um, so the ethical inclusion of the personal. Does attending to the personal reinforce and cultivate DEFI principles and virtue ethics? Um, or does it do something different? Engaging the personal, um, or here's my answer. It is essential to engage the personal and use virtue ethics, as I've already demonstrated, to enact the DFEI principles. Engaging the personal, whether the writer incorporates that engagement in their writing. So to be very clear, I believe in the power of position statements in writing. I do them as in my own writing, but that's not what I'm advocating for solely, although position statements fall under this broad rubric that I'm describing. Um, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is that we as writers and in teachers of writing, because we're all teaching writing, no matter your disciplinary or your professional context, um, is having some awareness, some reflexivity about what you're bringing to the scene of writing and what you're hoping to do is essential if you want to have an ethical practice. So let me make that argument. Uh, and then doing so forms a substrate of ethical and virtuous practices. With integrity, uh, to act with honesty in all situations, we must first be honest with ourselves. As a great thinker Socrates enjoined us, know thyself. We must ask ourselves, how do I know what I know? What beliefs and assumptions underlie my questions and my claims to knowledge? If you don't, if you can't answer those questions, how can you possibly be honest or have integrity with others? You're coming as a cloud. Trust, build trust in all stakeholder relationships. We know that someone who is self-delusional is not worthy of our trust. And I'm leaving aside here the belief that someone who is self-delusional might further our interests, which is different from being worthy of our trust, because this is, of course, a big political question right now. Um, how do I build trust? We need phronesis or practical wisdom to answer that question, to know what trust means, how it is expressed and enacted, and it's with these people at this particular moment in time. Accountability to accept responsibility for all decisions. This means knowing how I contributed to a decision, the nature of my participation. Sometimes that we, we're very conscious of that, and sometimes it takes some reflection to figure out how we contributed to a decision or participated. And the implicit and explicit motivations behind my participation. Again, this knowing starts with and is dependent upon self-knowledge. Finally, transparency. How can I maintain open and truthful communication? And with accountability, to be open and truthful in our communications requires self-knowledge and self-awareness so that we mean and can stand behind whatever it is that we're communicating. In my senior summit course, English 4880, I asked students to use the principles, the DFEI principles, and virtue ethics to analyze the epistemological, rhetorical, and ethical dimensions of the inclusion of the personal in the assigned course readings, 
And then they research and write a final project in which they incorporate their own personal. So just like last week, we discussed this book, which is called The Undocumented Americans by Carla Cornejo Villavicencio. Um, this book provides an intimate portrait of the lives of undocumented immigrants, of which Villavicencio, the writer, is one, or at least was one at the time that she wrote it. Our class discussion was motivated by this question. In what ways does she, via Vicencio, enact the principles and use virtue et ethics in her representation of this group of people? And the book is described here. I, I won't read those. So for example here, in what ways is the following statement a statement of fact? In what ways is it shaped by her overtly personal perspective? Okay, so here we're traveling this objective, subjective, binary, fact versus her personal perspective. She's writing about day laborers um, at a worker center with whom she spent about 18 months. And here's her description of these day laborers. They have all experienced racist abuse and wage theft at the hand of their employers, are all owed thousands of dollars by white men who made them work for days, promised payment, then simply disappeared. So my students and I, the question before them was, could you argue that this is a statement of fact, that this is that this statement has integrity, that it would build trust with readers, that it's Via Vicencio is, is accountable for her writerly decisions, that she's being transparent, that she's being fair in this representation. In our class discussion, my students landed more on the characterization of abuse as racist, as that would be the stopping point. And then we talked about as well, how, how was her personal perspective, her investment in this question as an undocumented person whose father had had to work as a day laborer, how was that shaping even her engagement with these workers? And what was she, for whom was she writing this book? So these are rhetorical questions, but they are intimately connected inextricably to these ethical questions. To whom does she have the strongest ethical obligation? How do we weigh those ethical obligations? It's word choice is so important. It, it is, but if you, if you, if she changed the word choice, then she might lose the trust of another group, right? There, there's no perfect way. Any, uh, where we land in, in rhetoric studies is often, you can't reach all of your audiences. Right. You can't well, trust equally with all of your audiences. Because once you use one word or one framework, you're leaving out other people or you're irking other people. Uh, okay, so one other example, and then I wanted to hear what, what you all thought. She writes, I see my father's face in their every one. And I know that this astigmatism will always be with me. The light will always fall this way. In what ways is her perspective narrowed or constrained and deepened or expanded by her overtly biased approach to the subjects, these undocumented immigrants of her writing? So in my class, the question animating us this school semester has been, when we bring in our personal, often in academia, the long-standing argument has been, Leave your personal outside, be as objective as, as possible. Maybe not in every discipline, but in many instances, write in the third person, don't use I, uh, act as if any, you know, any, any person could have arrived at the same findings. And so our question is, well, what happens when you don't do that? When you bring yourself in, when you incorporate that personal or that subjectivity, what are the rhetorical and ethical and epistemological gains of doing that? And what do you lose? And because it's never, it's never clear cut. And so in this instance, the question is, what does she get for in terms of her the reader's experience? What knowledge is gained? What rhetorical impact is gained 
when she tells us, I'm looking at these people about whom I'm writing and I am not objective. I see my father, I see his face in every single one of them. What does she gain by doing that and by telling us that she's doing that? And what does she lose? And imagine if you had a writer from a different subject position writing about, I don't know, the, the Supreme Court and say, well, I'm I'm seeing these faces through this lens. The, these people look my, like my grandparents and these people don't. My final question was going to be, um, if you just at our last slide, just for you to chew on. So attending to the personal would enhance undermine or X, meaning some other verb, the practice of ethical writing in my disciplinary or professional context. That's just something for, to, to think about.